<laughs> so let's be. talk about some of the new research that that is out um, okay. that that you're kind of excited seeing, um, or any other new research that has maybe uh, changed what you once thought about anything in relation to ADHD. Okay. Well, I, because of, of the recency effect, I'm going to talk about the APSARD meeting that I just came back from this weekend, because that's where a lot of the new findings were being summarized. Uh, uh, for instance, Kathy Rubia, a world-class neuroimager, was there from London giving uh, her presentation and her summary of all of the findings and the meta-analyses and everything. So, I mean, you can't get more state-of-the-art than, than that. And, and what uh, Dr. Rubia was talking about in neuroimaging is that we really have now isolated the regions of the brain that are troublesome in ADHD, uh, what it is about them that's problematic. They're, they're not only a little smaller, and, and they're not dramatically smaller, but they're small enough. Uh, but the biggest problem is their functional connectivity to other regions of the brain. So it's not just that the brain is a little smaller in some of these specific regions, the, the frontal lobe, uh, especially the midline, uh, the anterior cingulate, which is also at the midline, the uh, uh, caudate nucleus of the basal ganglia being another area of difficulty. So uh, it's that the connections among these regions and out to other regions are, are not functioning as effectively as they should. There are connections. It's not they're completely disconnected. Uh, but it's like static in the line on a TV or a radio program. It's going to be causing a lot of interference in the ability of these regions to work together to create this behavior or cognitive ability that is so essential uh, to us, these executive functions. So that is amazing because you're now seeing all the literature converging on an understanding of brain regions and connectivity. Uh, and so that's exciting. The second thing is they're beginning well, if I can to ask, walk. If I, if I can ask oh, yeah. you first, um, sure. so I know I've seen you present on that and, and yeah. uh, uh, read some of the stuff you've, read, uh, or you've written about that. So is there is the research that, that was presented more just confirmation of what was initially believed or was there something new added to what is already out there? Well, a good question. First of all, it, it's more added on top of what okay. we already knew. And as Katya pointed out, there are now more than 300 to 400 neuroimaging studies alone, which we can pull together and do a meta-analysis and, and give us robust conclusions. It's no longer hypothetical or maybe, or gee, it's in the head, or one investigator found it and another one didn't. Meta-analyses have the ability to show us how robust a finding is. Okay. This is very robust. So it's no longer an issue. It is and what kind of scanning is being used? Uh, that she combines all of them. So we're looking at MRI, fMRI, PET, and the latest in white matter structural uh, imaging of the white matter connectivity. And you know, through her analyses, they're able to look at each of these kinds of measures. Mm. Uh, and it's just uniform across the board. Mm. I, I would have to say that I think one of the more uh, enticing new findings from the literature is they're no longer comparing ADHD to typical people. Now the comparisons are ADHD to autism, ADHD to OCD, ADHD mm. to learning disability, ADHD to anxiety and depression, because the real issue here is how are these brain regions different from other disorders? What is specific about ADHD? And her research was able to show that several of these regions, both the frontal lobe back to the basal ganglia, are specific to ADHD. They're not found in autism. They're not part of OCD. They're not part of anxiety, depression. And mm. that is very illuminating because just because you get a difference between an ADHD and a typical group doesn't mean that that's ADHD. 80% of these ADHD people have other disorders. And mm. so we need to kind of sort it out and get more specific. And, and that to me was a light bulb going off in my head as I listened to her present these results, that these are specific to this disorder. You can't so blame another, it on anything else. Yeah. So this might be another way to sort of rule out other things, it sounds like. Yes, absolutely. And that was her point, that there may come a day where neuroimaging mm. has such precision that it may help us to sort out what's the result of comorbidity and what is specific to the ADHD condition itself. So I think I it was that four, was really good. I think it was four, five, maybe six years ago, you said at the keynote address at Chad um, that we think you were 10 to 15 years away from neuroimaging to be able to diagnose 
cases of ADHD. Do you still? I, I would put it down to probably two to five now. Oh, wow. Uh, now, and that may be overly optimistic. You know, scientists tend to get that way and, and problems get in the way of our optimism. I would have thought we would have had uh, a gene uh, a diagnostic techniques now. Uh, that's still a possibility, uh, but, you know, we, we don't have it just yet. Uh, because of complexity. But the, the issue with functional imaging is some of the newest techniques which have to do with white matter uh, structural connectivity of these fiber bundles is so precise uh, and so brilliant in how refined a picture it gives of tracks and fibers and bundles and pathways and how they activate uh, that uh, many people are thinking that these will be uh, at a level of precision hmm. to take into clinical practice. And we've never had that level of precision where any of us would recommend neuroimaging for clinical practice, but we're getting close. And hmm. these are tantalizingly close. Joe Halpern at my medical center is doing this, as are many other people. Uh, and, and I'm telling you, the images of the brain and the difficulties that they're finding are enormously greater than the old MRI studies from 10, 15, 20 years ago ever led on to be. I mean, they're, they're startling in how different the brain is in how these regions are connecting to each other. And, hmm. and that, to me, offers a great deal of hope here. We're not ready yet. I don't want people rushing out to their latest neuroimaging center, uh, just like people have rushed out to get you know, their DNA done at some of these 23andMe and other things. We're not there yet. These aren't reliable. Don't don't count on DNA to help you out here. And the same is true with neuroimaging. But boy, we're getting salivatingly close to possibly having these lab measures on our side for diagnosis. Have you had your brain scanned? Yes. <laughs> I, I think I know if I had access to that kind of stuff, you better believe I would want my brain scan. That, yeah. that would just be cool just to see and to yeah. know kind of it what's was, going it on. It was. It was very cool. I had it done for another reason, uh, but uh, it's uh, it's an interesting thing. I don't know that I want to go through it again, but <laughs> hopefully I won't have to. 